Hey everyone, in this video I'm taking us way back to high school English class with a bicycle book report on Jan Heine's The All-Road Bike Revolution, which explains what makes an all-road bike comfortable and fast, all while summarizing two decades of scientific bike research and experimentation. Now, if like me and so many others, you've recently been swept up in the gravel bike movement, then this is a must-read book that'll give you some perspective on the trends in the cycling industry, as well as just be a fantastic primer on the vast scope of drop bar bicycles available and shed some light on the subtle and sometimes not so subtle nuances therein. Now, when you think of gravel bikes and adventure cycling, most people will see it as a new trend in cycling and often question whether a new segment is really necessary. The most extreme critics, of course, are those that claim that every bike is a gravel bike, or that gravel bikes are just repackaged 90s mountain bikes, and that this is just a way for the cycling industry to sell us more stuff. And who can blame them, really? It's pretty clear that the cycling industry has recently gone all in on the gravel bike movement, as every major and minor bike company has its own gravel bike offering or two. However, I think it's important to realize that while the hype and marketing are pretty new, gravel bikes, or more generally all-road bikes, are certainly not. And while I can't personally claim to be an OG gravel cyclist, whatever that means, there are many cyclists out there who have quietly been gravel grinding for decades now, long before it was mainstream cool. And of course, one of the biggest proponents of the all-road style bike is Dr. Jan Heine, who is the editor-in-chief of his own periodical, Bicycle Quarterly, or BQ for short, which is a relatively underground publication started almost 20 years ago in 2002. And it includes fantastic articles spotlighting inspiring rides from around the world, as well as technical articles that are based on scientific testing and experimentation. Now in his newest book, The All-Road Bike Revolution, he essentially distills 20 years of research into an easily digestible 250-pager that I read in nearly one sitting the first time around. And that's saying a lot for me. It's structured into three parts covering first, what things to consider when choosing your all-road bike, Second, a concise summary of years of experimental results, including a great discussion on bike geometry and the differences between the several subdivisions of drop bar bike style, like road, gravel, cyclocross, and many others. And the third section is an encyclopedic description of the anatomy of the all-road bike, including fascinating discussions on tire width, tire pressure, wheel spoke count, frame material, fork design, brake type, drivetrains, chain lines, and even down to accessories like fenders, rack types, and bike lights. And all of this packaged up in a down-to-earth, non-judgy style designed to inform the reader and present anecdotal evidence from years of experience. Now for me, being an academic researcher myself, I found the second section summarizing all these scientific results to be the most fascinating. However, as a whole, the book is written for a non-technical audience. And what's really nice is that anytime a specific result is mentioned, a bibliographic reference is provided to the actual BQ article that drew that conclusion. Now in this way, the book almost reads as a literature review, which is something you'd see near the top of any technical journal publication, but clearly done in a more engaging and accessible manner. Now in this way, the second section of the book provides a comprehensive overview of some of the primary research findings without going into too much detail on testing procedures and also provides a resource for further reading. Now, over the years, this accumulation of scientific data and experimental results have led to some pretty convincing evidence that flat out contradict several long-standing dogmas in the cycling world. But perhaps the most influential of these results is the idea of wider, more supple tires not only being more comfortable, but actually faster as well. It's an idea that directly challenges the old notions of needing high-pressure, skinny tires to maximize your speed. Now I don't want to give away too much here, but there's this idea of the difference between perceived speed and actual speed, and it turns out that humans are actually pretty bad at judging speed. So on super skinny high pressure tires, we feel that high frequency road vibration, and we falsely associate that feeling with speed and efficiency, when in reality we're actually wasting a lot of energy making the bike translate up and over each little bump. Now it's pretty clear that the cycling industry is adopting this mentality with modern road bikes being specced with wider and wider tires on each iteration. And what's really interesting is that it's also pretty clear that the research published in BQ is at least partially responsible for this movement of wider tires being faster, which gives you a sense of the impact of the research published in BQ. Now another section of the book I was fascinated by is the discussion on planing, which is the idea that the right amount of flex in a frame can actually help propel you forward faster and for less energy expenditure. 
Now this clearly goes against the common notion of stiffer is better, and it's explained in simple terms using the jumping analogy. Now you'd have to read the book for a much better explanation, but standing on a hard surface like concrete, you can jump to a certain height. Then standing on a softer surface, say like sand on a beach, you find it's much harder to jump to the same height. But on say a trampoline which has just the right amount of flex, you can actually jump really high for the same amount of energy or even less. Now in the same way, a bike with just the right amount of flex for a given rider can potentially lead to a more efficient use of the rider's power, propelling them forward with each pedal stroke in much the same way that at the right frequency you can get a lot of height for relatively little energy with each jump on a trampoline. Then, and this is on a very personal level, I'm also really happy that the book correctly uses the term damping when referring to energy absorbed and converted into heat. Now for whatever reason, it really bugs me when people say dampening in this context, which actually means to make something slightly wet. Anyways, now we're getting a little bit snooty. It's a small detail, but I appreciate it nonetheless. Now, while Jan and his team have been plugging away in experimental cycling research for the better part of two decades, for whatever reason, the cycling industry is only now seeing the opportunities associated with marketing bikes for adventure seekers and not just racers. Now, why the industry is experiencing this paradigm shift in bike philosophy is unclear, but Spindat's recent video on how gravel killed cyclocross offers, in my opinion, a pretty compelling argument that could at least provide a partial explanation. So be sure to check that out if you have a minute. Now this book isn't designed by any means to go out and prove any points and say that the cycling industry is wrong at any level. Rather, it neutrally refers to real world testing results and allows the reader to draw their own conclusions while also painting a very clear picture of the all road bike landscape as it stands today. I'm also happy to report that it's not in any way a sales pitch to buy Rene Hurst tires or components, which is a bike component company that Jan also happens to own. In fact, as far as I can recall, there's no specific mention of the company's tire brand in the book at all. And even if there is, it's not meant to try and sell you anything. Rather, you get an impartial discussion summarizing test results from tires of different properties, including width, diameter, tread pattern, and casing suppleness. Also, throughout the book are delightful illustrations that are as informative as they are fun to look at. It's a small detail, but they give the book a much more approachable feel, as they could easily have smothered the book with scientific plots and diagrams instead. Now, from what I understand, the illustrator, Miyoshi, is a Japanese artist who shares the same passion for cycling as Jan and his team, so it was a natural fit. Reading the Rene Hurst blog, it's fascinating to see how much effort went into making this book accessible to all readers, and I really appreciate the thought that went into the artistic elements in the book. Now you'll notice that they're simple illustrations, but they're incredibly effective in conveying the idea of the corresponding text. So, do I recommend the book to fellow cyclists? Heck yeah! As a technically minded person, it would have been nice to see more numerical results from the experimental tests that are referenced throughout the book. But I think the problem with that is that it would start to read more as a textbook or a journal publication, and I totally see why the editors wanted to avoid that. Now, of course, anyone who wants to read more in depth on any one particular study, you can always go back to that back issue of BQ for more detail. And to that end, the only thing that I'd like to see made available on the BQ website is perhaps a bundle of the reference issues of BQ to go along with this book for anyone interested in diving deeper into a particular subject. BQ could call it the Literature Review Bundle, or the Bibliography Pack. It is 22 issues that are referenced throughout the book, I counted, but I know that I'd be the first one to buy one as a supplement to the book. Now even though this particular bundle of back issues isn't available on the website, at least right now, for your convenience I've gone ahead and done the legwork for you. So if you are interested, you can check out the list of references, essentially the bibliography for the book, down in the description. Again, it's 22 issues, which is a lot, but there nonetheless, in case you want to purchase some or all of them individually. Well, clearly this is a book that I really enjoyed reading, and I think if you're a cyclist of any age, skill, or philosophy, you ought to give it a read. This is just like foundational reading that all cyclists should have as a reference, and it serves as a reminder that speed is not the only metric that defines a good drop bar bike. It's not pretentious in the least, and it covers a ton of ground, while also discussing each topic in enough detail for the average reader, but not so much as to become overwhelmed. And as an added bonus, you also get contributions by the literal gravel king, Ted King, ultra endurance cycle adventurist, Lael Wilcox, and Open and Cervello's co-founder, Gerard Vrooman. 
Now, it's not every day cyclists get to read an entire book specifically tailored to their beloved hobby, so I hope you give this book a read. And if you already did, I'd love to hear what you thought about it down in the comments. Thanks again for watching and subscribing if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time.